Having completely transformed the soldiers in royal fashion, he made for Britain, where he set many things right, and he was the first to do so, erected a wall along a length of 80 miles, which was to separate barbarians and Romans. So says the Historia Augusta, which as you, many of you will know, was composed at the end of the fourth century. But that is why, and thank you very much to Tony Burley's excellent biography of Hadrian, that is why we are here today in an afternoon in February in 2022, in the 1900th anniversary year of Hadrian arriving in Northern Britain to supervise the building of his wall. So you are all incredibly welcome to what is our second digital wall cap community archeology span conference. It's fantastic uh, to see so many of you here this afternoon. Um, more will be joining. And um, uh, 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 I have um, a few uh, housekeeping notes to say, but first of all, I want to just say you're hugely welcome. I'm Jane Gibson. I'm the chair of the Hadrian's Wall Partnership Board, and it's an absolute honour that I've been invited to open the conference um, today. And, and so many friends um, from the previous conferences and the, the ones that we used to do live um, when we were uh, in Carlisle Racecourse and then before that. Now, I just want to draw your attention to a moving picture, if you've got your cameras open, to the, um, the edifying picture of John Scott, who is there with his uh, bright orange gilet on. And um, John has chosen this weekend for his wife, Annika, to celebrate her birthday. So Annika um, likes to do something active each of her birthdays. So this year she has chosen to cycle the Hadrian Cycleway, which is why John is joining us on his mo mobile phone. John, can you hear me? Where are you? Hi, Jane. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I hope you're all really well. Um, we have just left the coffee shop at Glanacost, the excellent cafe there, and uh, we're just making our way up the hill towards Banks um, East Turret. So those are people that know that really well know that I'm about to go to one of the best views off the wall as, uh, as we go along. But uh, I took the excuse to stop and have this and have a chat to you guys. And Annika's gone off up the hill like a rocket, so I'm going to have to catch her up. And I've told her to wait for a bit, Bird Oswald. But I just want to tune in and say, everybody have a great time. I'm going to join you in the week. Um, and, um, and I'm just inspecting the cycleway over the course of this weekend. Absolutely, John. Well, look, it's great to see you back on a bike. Those of you who know that uh, last year was a bit of a hard year for John and his bike, but it's great that uh, that you're doing that. And actually, we do need that uh, that cycleway inspecting, John, because after uh, the storms uh, of our recent storms in our in our part of the world. So, look, have a great trip. Happy birthday to Annika, and we'll see you on uh, on Tuesday at the, the rest of the conference. See you, Jane. See you, everybody else. Bye. Bye, John. Bye, John. Right. So, look, we've got a packed program um, for today, but we've got a packed pa uh, pack program for the West rest of the week as well. I want to pay a particular welcome. Yes to Matthew Rabagliati, who is our keynote speaker. I mean, I would, of course, say Dr. Rob Collins is our keynote speaker, only he's not. It's actually Matt um, uh, from um, uh, UK National Commission for UNESCO. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us, Matthew, today. So we've got a short session today uh, on, our, on our opening day. And just to let you know that three o'clock is the comfort break. So that's when you can go and put the kettle on. But I uh, believe that the timing of this session today was to coincide with the rugby kickoff at 4.45, England versus Wales. But Kerry wants to apologise to Scottish colleagues because the earlier game, you're missing the earlier game um, this afternoon. But it, probably at three o'clock, you can all go um, and turn the radios on and the tellies on when you're putting the kettle on. So just to recap, I think most of you will have the programme probably in front of you. Um, but we're going to be talking to Rob um, about the uh, update of WallCap. Um, uh, then we'll talk to Matt about UNESCO and World Heritage Sites. That's 50 years of working towards peace. Has there ever been a day when that is a more apposite topic as we are as we enter day three of war in Europe? I thought talking about COVID was going to be 
bizarre enough uh, on our conference, but here we are now talking about um, about war. We then have a comfort break. Then we're joined at 3.10 uh, by Bill talking about our 1900 festival, obviously this being our big celebration year. And then at 3.30 till four o'clock, we start our discussion time. And what, we, what we're planning to do, like we've done in the past, is that as you're hearing the talks, start to put your questions in the chat. That's just a very sort of democratic way of doing, doing questions. You can also though, just unmute and wave your hand, you know, use your yellow hand in your reactions or just wave your hand if you want to ask a question. And we, what we're trying to do is, uh, is, is create an atmosphere where people can have conversations in that half hour. Um, so, you know, do, it, it works pretty well last year so so do feel able to to just sort of you know say oh I've got an extra point to add to that to that answer to that question or we'll try and keep it as relaxed as possible we're trying to replicate what it would be like for us all to be in the room together so that's what we'll be doing at the at the last half hour of, of the session but the the really useful thing is to have the questions in the chat typed in and sometimes what happened in previous years is that some of you had data to add. So you might say, actually, I've got a really useful report or actually I visited that site um, and I just want to add this. And the, the chat is, um, is saved by Kerry uh, and Catherine on a separate stream. So that's really useful for data because obviously then Wallcap owns the knowledge that goes into the chat. So, so that's really, really useful. So just a few housekeeping notes. So following evaluation and feedback from the last year's event, um, as many of you will know, there has been a monthly programme of talks on the topics that, uh, that you've been suggesting. And that's going to continue until the end of September 2022, when wall cap ends. But actually, I do not want to see that written in type Kerry that wall cap is ending because it seems impossible that something so brilliant can end at the end of this year so obviously conversations are ongoing about what the future will look like uh, but there's also going to be a chance for you to suggest topics that you'd like to hear about um, following the evaluation of this year's event. So if there's something that you think, oh, I really want to know more about that, write it down on a piece of paper and then add it into your evaluation at the end. And, uh, and Kerry pretty much will be delivering um, everything that, that you suggest. So I've told you about the rugby kickoff. Um, so as you know, we've already pressed the record button. So um, uh, I think that uh, we we, it's sort of good practice to stop the recording when we do the chats, just in case somebody feels that it's a bit um, formal for them to um, be on the official record, which will be then able to be available afterwards on the channels. So we like to stop um, the recording uh, when we get to the, well, it'll be 3.30 today, just so that you all feel really relaxed about unmuting and asking any question or making any comments that you want. I think we achieved this really well last year. There was a really informal atmosphere. And why would there not be an informal uh, atmosphere? Because this is your wall cap and this is your conference. So we just want to make everybody really comfortable. And just in terms of um, signing up for all the other talks, which I know many of you will want to do, bookings are open until an hour before each of the talks starts. So there's plenty of time for you to think uh, whether you can um, uh, put in some extra time and listen, um, listen to more amazing, edifying, amusing, wonderful things um, that we're going to be talking about over our conference for this year. So Rob, has just come back from holidays and he's actually been at Disneyland, not um, studying archaeological excavations from around the world, Rob Collins, but you've uh, had a fantastic holiday. He's just landed. He hasn't even started his laundry yet, but I know he will be able to give us a really illuminating 20 minutes on what's been happening um, over the last year. So Rob, over to you. Thank you, Jane. Okay, I'll just start sharing my screen. Okay, can everyone see that okay? I can just get a thumbs up. Excellent, thank you very much. Okay, well, my brief task today is to just uh, give everyone a bit of an update on what's happened in 
2021 with wall cap. Um, what I'm going to have to be really careful about is not going too much into detail because, um, well, Jane, for example, is here, and I know that she's got a fantastic talk lined up later this week um, to talk about the excavations. So I'm going to try and avoid pinching um, anyone else's content or stealing their thunder from later in the week. Um, the, I think the other thing that to highlight is that um, those words that, that uh, Jane, our chair, did not want to hear or say is that WellCap is coming to an end this year. Um, and I think it's important to, to be honest and mention that, but also think about what that means in, in the, the positive elements, hopefully, of, of a project like this coming to an end. <clears throat> so with that in mind, I will just start moving on. So I make sure I take note of time. I'm still in holiday mode, everyone. So if, if I get a little bit confused or have any flashbacks to you know, Disney World or something, my apologies. Um, so basically, we've had it, an extremely active year uh, through 2021. Um, this was um, for a few reasons. One is that the various lockdown restrictions uh, associated with COVID eased and lightened up, and then they kind of came back into place, but then lightened up again. Um, so there was lots of movement and dynamism about what sort of events we could hold in person and what sort of events we continue to hold digitally. Um, because of the really the fantastic inclusivity and participation we experienced with all the digital offerings uh, through, through lockdown. We were committed to try and make sure that we, we continue to offer those, those digital events. And so we did. Um, and so things like the, the monthly volunteer tea breaks uh, have been kept uh, going by, by Carrie. Um, in a digital offering, the Wallcap Book Club, which was something we started during uh, lockdown is a is a way to still kind of engage with the wall and make sure we had a chance to just kind of meet and chat. We've kept that going. Um, and I know some of the members of the book club are here today. Um, who can always express their opinions about how successful or frustrating that may have been. Sometimes we didn't always see eye to eye on our book readings. Um, in uh, Kiel, our community geologists continue to offer guided geology walks as, as well as other events associated, sorry, associated with SSD, the stone sourcing and dispersal strand of the project. Uh, we continue to have all sorts of various online learning opportunities. Um, Jane Harrison offered, you know, various online training uh, associations to um, training events, I should say, um, to help skill up volunteers around the field work that we did. There was also um, various thematic events. We had a monthly kind of lecture series of various experts. Um, one of the things that was extremely successful, we're pleased to say, was the the um, FRE Fridays, the Frontiers of the Roman Empire Fridays we had in November, um, in which we saw, um, you know, people joining in from, from all around the world. You know, we had people attending from Japan and China who were staying up till 2 a.m. in the morning to be able to, to watch various experts talk about frontiers across the Rhine, the Danube, the Near East and North Africa. Um, we did a lot of field-based observations associated with stone sourcing dispersal. And then we also had excavations, uh, particularly at Hedden on the Wall, Port Carlisle, and Corbridge. So a lot of those things you'll hear about much more on Thursday, I believe, is the Wall Cap Day uh, for talks. And um, so if you want to know more about those in detail, please do sign up for Thursday's talks. And um, one of the cool things that we've been able to really investigate during our, our fieldwork excavations and I know that Jane Harrison will have a lot more to say on all sorts of matters, but one of the really interesting things that our, our much more limited excavations have been able to show is actually so much of the diversity of Hadrian's Wall and how it was built. And so uh, here I provide just simply two examples of different details of foundations to the stone curtain that we were able to see. Um, so the image on the right is, is our excavations at, at Walltown that were done back in November of 2020, in fact, um, or maybe it was October, whatever the case, it was uh, cold and windy, a bit rainy, and on the last day it was even snowy. Um, but what we were able to see there was how Hadrian's Wall is built upon solid bedrock. Um, whereas if you then fast forward to our excavations at Cambeck, uh, just outside of Brampton and Cumbria, which was in April of 2021, uh, where it was glorious weather, birds were tweeting, the sun shined um, pretty much every hour of every day, um, but there we saw that the wall was very heavily robbed out, but very different building construction techniques uh, in which there just seems to have been a, a series of, of cobbled stones uh, thrown onto the ground, um, which then had facing stones built on it. There wasn't really good solid bedrock to be building on. And also much harder, much more challenging archaeology to, to see and read. For those of you in attendance who are at uh, Cambeck, 
um, I think we all learned to to read and distinguish the different shades of red soil, um, and which were kind of combinations of soil and degraded sandstone. Um, but what's been fantastic about all the various wall cap fieldwork uh, that we've done is, is just to see some of that that diversity in, in terms of how Hadrian's Wall has been constructed, um, how it was built, and also how it collapsed. Um, and as I say, I'm sure um, Jane Harrison will have more to say about this later in the week. Moving on slightly, one of the other things that we've looked at is a lot of the geological diversity that is associated with Hadrian's Wall. Um, and when I say geological diversity, it's effectively, there's quite a bit of stone variation. Um, this geological map in front of you shows you kind of the, the underlying solid geology. Each, each different color is a different type of foundation geology, bedrock geology. Um, but that actually um, has some real meaning when we look at the individual sandstones and just the sandstones that we know that the Romans were using in building the wall. And so these are uh, various lovely pictures by our community geologist, uh, Dr. Ian Keel, um, that shows you just some of that that diversity within the sandstone itself that you can see in the natural environment. And our investigations through stone sourcing and dispersal have allowed us to not only look at that source stone, but then to look at what stone is used um, in the building of the wall. We've also been able to explore uh, some of the quarry sites. Um, and here, Dr. Katie O'Donnell led us um, to on some, some journeys to various quarry sites, uh, such as Queen's Crag, I believe, is one of those. Um, and Fellfield Fell, um, to see some of those actual sites where the Romans were quarrying that stone to build Hadrian's Wall, what that looked like. But then we've also looked at post-Roman structures as well to see how those um, have reused Roman stone and, and how those actually help us better understand Hadrian's Wall, even though they're now no longer part of the wall. And what, oops, sorry, what is happening with that is that a lot of our volunteers have been very busy in recent weeks and months, uh, pulling a lot of that data together, putting it into an online database, um, and we'll be able to use that information, that data, to, to start coming out with some, some more kind of quantifiable numbers-based um, analysis of kind of how Hadrian's Wall, how the Roman ruins of Hadrian's Wall have become part of, of post-Roman and even modern communities. Um, but also the same thing is happening with the excavation. So uh, Jane has been leading on all the post-excavation analysis very diligently as well. And actually, every time we get a bit of specialist report back, it's we always hear something really fascinating. So uh, the news this last week is that some of our environmental samples um, have some excellent potential for, for dating, um, which is just, um, well, I, I suppose you can say all archeologists are obsessed with dating, but even so that's really great, great news to hear. Um, and um, you know our our post uh, our post excavation report from the specialist on the pottery, um, our our pottery specialist was super excited when when she started looking through the pottery. And every time she would send us an email, it was gushing and full of enthusiasm about our exciting ceramics. And um, so all sorts of really great information is coming together from all that field work that was conducted through 2021. And it's really a, a testament. Um, to the WallCap team, so uh, to, to Carrie, to Jane, to Ian, to Catherine, um, in terms of all the, the hard work that they did to pull all that work together, um, but also to our volunteers as well, who are, who are just you know, absolutely gung-ho and, and ready to, to press on, and, and press on we did. It was an extremely busy year. Um, I've looked at some kind of some numbers recently in, in kind of filling out some of our reports, and actually, once you... Um, you stack up all the different events that WallCap has been doing, whether that's field work or talks, hosting events like these, participating in other organizations' talks. Um, WallCap is is basically doing something for for the public or or other audiences, not just for us, but for someone else, at least every four days. So we're doing something on average every four days. Um, and when you factor in often some of that field work, let's take Corbridge for example. I want to say that was like twenty one days of excavation. That's a lot of work um, that, that has been done. Um, you know, that there were 25 to 30 people on site every day. Um, we've been able to do some really incredible things this past year, um, despite all the hurdles that COVID threw at us. And I'd, I'd very much like to thank the, the WallCap team for making that possible, but also our volunteers who, whom we couldn't have done any of this work without. So we now get to kind of the um, perhaps a slightly sadder part in terms of the conversation of, well, what next? One of the things that we will continue to do um, is, as Jane has alluded, is there will be talks going on through the year. 
um, we'll continue to have sort of um, more events and things that our volunteers and, and members of the public can be engaged in. Um, we've been uh, very happy to be sharing things on social media and actually it, it seems like what our what our social media accounts are doing is also attracting a lot of attention. So, um, you know, Catherine has been a, a champion in it putting things on social media and um, in getting the word out about WallCap and, and the wider World Heritage Site uh, around the globe. And we can see that in our, in our analytics that we have people picking up things all around the world, which is fantastic. So it's, it's always great to be sharing that, that good news from the wall. Um, so I continue to, to encourage people to follow our social media, um, even if you don't wanna be a volunteer with the project. The other thing that we've got coming up is um, an, a village atlas project for Hadrian's Wall. So working with the archeological practice, there'll be six villages along Hadrian's Wall, um, where we'll pull together a bit of a village history. Uh, and, and of, so you can see how the, how the different villages along Hadrian's Wall, and it's, it's a, we're committed to the full length of Hadrian's Wall. So you can see how those different villages have both similar and slightly different histories and try and capture some of the diversity of those communities that we see along Hadrian's Wall. And um, as we continue going forward over the coming weeks and months, we'll have more information from post-excavation analysis, from the stone sourcing dispersal analysis that we'll be able to share with people. Um, I'm also happy to report that all the museum work that we've done, uh, working with Tully House in Carlisle, working with the Great North Museum in, in Newcastle, um, and also with the SIL at, at Twice Brood. Um, so we've had three exhibitions. Uh, the SIL was a temporary exhibition, but at Tully House and the GNM, those are permanent exhibitions. Um, I'll be speaking a bit more about those later in the week. Um, and we also have um, actually a whole core of volunteers, um, a, a small army of volunteers, I think it's fair to say, who are really actively engaged in Hadrian's Wall. Very talented, very skilled volunteers who want to take things forward. And that's something that Carrie in particular will be doing um, in the coming weeks and months is trying to work with those volunteers and, and find a way to make sure that all that fantastic enthusiasm and energy that, that's around for Hadrian's Wall can continue to, to produce the positive results that, that we've seen over the past years. Um, that does mean though, that we, we need those kind of volunteers to, um, to be proactive, to, to share that enthusiasm and, and kind of take things forward because you know all, all good things eventually must come to an end. Um, you know, we're very fortunate that, that the National Lottery Heritage Fund was able to extend wall cap, um, that some of the underspend we had because of COVID and lockdown, they were able to say, that's fine. Uh, we could carry on into 2022 because actually we were supposed to end in December of, of 2021. Um, but all that means we, we are coming to an end at the end of September of 2022. Um, and so the onus is now upon us as a team uh, to make sure that all that hard work uh, that's been done over the past years um, but, you know, particularly the post-excavation analysis, the, the writing of reports, all the lessons learned, all the new information gained is, is finalized and ready and made available for the public by the end of the project. So that's a lot of, of our effort coming forward and going forward into the coming months. Um, but there will be other things for volunteers and the public to also be involved in. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Rob, and um, well done um, uh, post-holiday for uh, being able to take us through uh, through those slides. Matt, Matthew, may I call you Matt, actually? Kerry called you Matt earlier on, which is why I... Uh, is, is that OK? Only Matthew when I'm being told off, so that's All fine. right, OK, well, then we definitely don't want to be calling you... Uh, we don't definitely don't want that. So if you're ready, please, um, yeah, with course. your presentation and maybe just a little introduction about, about yourself. Of course, let me see if I can share my screen first. Can you all see that? Yay. Great. Hi, everyone. Well, first of all, you've been incredibly busy. And thank you. Thank you, Rob, for uh, an amazing update on the extraordinary uh, amount of work that you've been doing. A an event every four days uh, is absolutely extraordinary. And I'd also like to say Thank you to uh, Jane, Kerry and John uh, for inviting me along today to, to talk to all of you. It's a, it's a great uh, honour and privilege to be here. Uh, my name's uh, Matt Rebagliati. I am Head of Policy, Research and Communications at the UK National Commission for UNESCO. Uh, the UK Commission is uh, funded uh, by the Foreign Office. And our role essentially is as a, a constitutional part of the UK's membership, uh, we make sure that the UK is fulfilling its role at UNESCO. 
uh, whether that's in journalism protection to the tsunami warning system to world heritage, but also making sure that the, the benefits of UNESCO membership are brought to the UK. So to kick things off, first of all, I'd like to say a big uh, happy birthday to Hadrian and his wall. And uh, um, what Kerry always told me that it's always really good to start with a historical depiction of a Roman. So here it is. Um, but seriously, I'd like to say also that it's absolutely um, extraordinary uh, what you've been doing, what, you know, the, the wall cap, for example, is absolutely amazing, but also the 1900 festival. Uh, the fact that you've got so many events and community groups and people coming together to celebrate and use that heritage to celebrate, um, you know, the wall, its history, et cetera. But also, as I said, that community engagement is, is amazing. So, you know, big congratulations to all of you. Um, right. What am I going to talk about? Well, what I'd like to do, first of all, is do uh, an introduction to UNESCO and its mission. I then want to talk a little bit about where do World Heritage Sites fit into this mission and this sort of United Nations sort of idea. And then hopefully, and you can uh, help me on this as well, is how do uh, Hadrian's Wall fulfill UNESCO's mission? Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit more about the 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention that's also taking place this year. And ultimately, what I'm going to say is that, yes, the cultural heritage and this magical term we call it outstanding universal value are really, really important uh, for the world story, etc. But probably what is more important and uh, it aligns with UNESCO's message is that you through Wallcap and this 1900 festival, you are bringing people from charities, art organizations, local societies, local authorities, and visitors together to celebrate your heritage. And heritage is a tool to bring people together, to create intercultural dialogue, and ultimately to foster peace. So moving on, the first thing I'd like to sort of talk about is the notion and the idea of peace because it very much forms the bedrock of what the United Nations and UNESCO is all about. So the first thing I'd like you all to do and uh, taking sort of Jane's initiative really is have a think about what does peace mean to you and sort of start to collect those thoughts and post them into the chat. So I'd be really interested to see through working on wall cap, through volunteering, etc and the World Heritage Site at Hadrian's Wall, what does peace mean to you? So talking now about UNESCO's founding idea, what I've done before we move on to United Nations definition is just post in here some quotes for, on what various people across the ages have said peace is. And as you can see here on the bottom left, we've got um, one of my favorite uh, sort of heroes is Dag Hammarskjöld, who was the United Nations Secretary General, uh, he was sadly killed uh, flying over Northern Rhodesia. But um, he starts with a very personal, individual definition of peace. And he says that it must begin within the private world of each of us. To build for a man a world without fear, we must be without fear. To build a world of justice, we must be just. And if you move up to the top, you've got Gandhi, who was obviously um, an extraordinary individual who fought for peace uh, in, an, in a non-violent way. He looks it up as an individual, as a collective whole. As you can see from these quotes itself, there is no universal definition of peace. It's a really elusive concept. What it looks like depends on your culture, your background, who you are and your tradition. But it's something, this vision or this idea that we're all achieve, you know, trying to reach for. Of course, in the West, we've um, taken a rather negative view or a negative connotation of, of peace from people such as Thomas Hobbes. Um, and I think it's really sort of uh, resonant this week, actually, that peace is the absence of war. I don't think he actually said that, but it's attributed to him that actually peace is the absence of war. And you've got people such as Spinoza, who was saying that peace is a function of autonomy and power. So what does peace mean then in a United Nations context and a UNESCO context? So the United Nations, as we all know, was founded in 1945. 
There's a brilliant uh, tweet this morning from Antonio Guterres. He says that actually out of the Second World War came the need to prevent war. So as we know, the Second World War was a, a huge global conflict that killed 50 million people and saw 100 million people fight. And out of this idea came the need to actually create the mechanisms to maintain peace and security. So you've got the United Nations General Assembly and the United Nations uh, Security Council for those purposes. And it's uh, really nicely summed up in the beautiful preamble of the United Nations itself that we, the people of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind, and to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women and of nations large. And to this end, it has three sort of main articles. The first is to maintain international peace and security. The second is to develop friendly relations among nations. And the third, and this will lead on to obviously World Heritage Sites here, is to achieve international cooperation in solving international problems of an economic, social, cultural, or humanitarian character. And I think one of, again, one of the, my favorite, one of my favorite people, Dag Hammarskjöld, he had the absolutely extraordinary quote that the United Nations was not created in order to bring us to heaven, but in order to save us from hell. And I think it's an extraordinary idea and mechanism to bring international dialogue between countries to instead of going to war to actually foster and speak and break down uh, through dialogue uh, instead of going to war ultimately so where does unesco fit into this so unesco is a united nations agency and i'm going to show a couple of images now to show where does unesco's brand an idea of peace fit into this United Nations mission. And it starts with these two images. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, uh, which were two bombs dropped in Japanese cities that, in the closing days of the Second World War. Now, what's important in the context of this presentation is that the, the bombs were the coming together of scientists from all across Western Europe and North America through the Manhattan Project, who came together to create and these bombs and bring the world into the nuclear age. Oppenheimer, when he um, saw the bomb and destruction, had the famous line from the Hindu script, I have become the destroyer of worlds. UNESCO, in its idea, wanted to move away from this to this. And this, if uh, I'm sure you're all aware, is CERN. It's what's called a Large Hadron Collider that sits under the borders of France and Switzerland. And what they do there is they spin particles near the speed of light and they crash them into each other and to see what happens. They've discovered something called the Higgs boson, which is the fundamental particle, one of the fundamental particles that makes up the universe. But obviously, incredible for science. But also what's really important is that you have scientists from all over the world, different backgrounds, different um, nations, genders, etc., who all come together, collaborate on scientific purposes to advance our understanding of the universe. And ultimately, that is what UNESCO is about. It's about using education, science, and culture to bring people together to foster peace. CERN itself was actually created under the auspices of UNESCO in 1954. It brought these scientists together in Paris who signed the declaration to create uh, the body which now exists in its form today. So UNESCO has played a really important role across the last 75 years in bringing scientists and people together to foster peace. So coming back quickly to Hiroshima. Hiroshima, uh, Hiroshima, sorry, was, um, is actually now a World Heritage Site. Um, it's the structure, the industrial uh, factory that was the last remaining piece that actually survived the bomb. And in its outstanding universal value, uh, it has a what I suggest you go and read it. It's brilliant. And one of the probably the most worthy World Heritage Sites I think there are, uh, that it, it symbolizes the tremendous destructive power which humankind can invent on the one hand. But on the other hand, it also reminds us of the hope for world permanent peace. So 
just moving on just quickly just by way of another example unesco um, is actually responsible as i said at the beginning for the tsunami warning system it brings scientists and countries together from all over the world who have uh, these things the, the floats that sit in oceans it provides a place where they can warn each other of tsunamis that are coming uh, this is a, a platform called the intergovernmental oceanographic commission uh, we're fortunate to have our delegation based down in southampton at the national oceanographic center so they are pulling in their data sharing it with countries around the world to try and avert tsunamis they negotiate access for scientific research vessels to uh, various international waters so that they can actually collaborate and it's an extraordinary exercise in that sense i hope you're beginning to see where world heritage potentially can fit into this very idea so just to bring it back home really unesco's missions and objectives so it contributes to peace and security for international collaboration in education sciences culture communication and information and it's summed up really beautifully in the preamble of the unesco constitution and the famous words that since wars begin in the minds of men it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed and of course we use uh, people now uh, in that sentence but ultimately if i understand if i can use education and we can break down the barriers uh, of misunderstanding between us if i understand your background where you're from we have joint projects in these places then we're less likely to go to war with each other and that's unesco in a nutshell's vision of how we build peace it comes down to an idea of what we call a, a humanist mission in its uh, in its essence so as i said it's a specialized agency of the united nations so everything that united nations sets it trickles down to uh, unesco it is a 193 member state organization so it's one of the largest um uh, specialized agencies of the united nations and in fact the world heritage convention as you all know is probably one of the most popular and most described to conventions across the whole of the united nations and of course bringing in a sense of realism it's not a uh, thing julian huxley uh famous scientist and the first director general of unesco he uh, did note the impossibility of unesco creating political peace out of a cultural and scientific hat can you um you know can you actually do so i think you can but of course it always comes with the, back to the idea that actually it is 193 countries so how does unesco take this massive mission and how does it actually implement it so it's a, a really i would say interesting but probably uh, <laughs> light reading with coffee uh, strategy for the organization uh, which we negotiated uh, last year uh, with the uk government and obviously all countries around the world but it sort of has five main functions in which it does it it serves as a laboratory of ideas so it will bring together cultural specialists journalists people around the world to actually come up with innovative ideas in which they can work together it's a clearinghouse so it will um one of unesco's obviously big aims is education um and it will publish curriculum it will publish information that people can take and use in their own countries it's a standard setter and we'll come on to this at the moment in the world heritage convention that the world heritage convention yes nominates sites world heritage sites but also sets a standard of what heritage protection should look like around the world it's a catalyst and motor for international cooperation that kind of uh have i explained already and it's a capacity builder one of UNESCO's big projects is actually working with governments, communities and people around the world to help them put in place education systems, journalism training systems, uh, GI, GI diversity, geology programs and systems. But a lot of this now, as I said, has been from the UN has sort of been overridden with something called the Sustainable Development Goals. And I think this is really important as well, because no longer is it just about preventing war peace as an idea over the last 30 to 40 years the road and how we achieve peace as a global community has centered around 
really important concepts of social justice, the empowerment of women, education, women and girls education, um, all manner of um, different forms of children's welfare, for example. And these were neatly put together in 2015, I think in a breakthrough, uh, through uh, 193 countries signing up to them. And they're called the Sustainable Development Goals. And they're essentially 17 interlinked and interdependent goals, which can save the planet, I would say, by 2030. Um, they include things such as no poverty. And what you're doing along Hadrian's Wall, Wall Cap and his festival is meeting and achieving a lot of these objectives quality education, good health and well-being. You see you've got there at SDG 16, peace, justice and strong institutions. And also really, really importantly, number 17, partnership. If we're going to save some of the biggest threats facing the world, we need to work together. And that's in our local, in our national and our international sort of uh, spheres. So what you're doing at Hadrian's Wall around bringing communities together would have huge learning and possibilities for world heritage sites around the world. The way that you have done um, community mapping of the wall, geotagging, et cetera, is incredibly important way that other people can learn from. So the question, where does world heritage fit into this rather um, high level notion and idea? So as we said earlier, the UNESCO Constitution, Article 2, that um, if you're going to collaborate and create peace, um, you have to protect the world inheritance of books, monuments, history and science. And what UNESCO tries to do is create international treaties that protect those things to do so. You can imagine in 1945-46 that huge amounts of the world's culture had been destroyed, books had been burned, um, fire bombing of cities, etc. And there was a real need to try and preserve uh, these items and traditions. So World Heritage site, Sites came up in the 1970s as a concept. You've got to imagine that, I mean, in the UK, we've had a very strong heritage protection system, uh, going back to people such as Octavia Hill, etc., right through the Ancient Monuments Acts in the 1800s. Most of the world did not have those systems in place. And a lot of them still don't. So the most important, one of the most important things about the World Heritage Convention is, first of all, it sets a standard for world heritage protect, uh, protection of heritage and the systems in place to do so at a national level. So it sets a standard of what heritage protection should look like. The second thing that it does is that it creates a list of sites and it encourages countries to identify, protect, and preserve those sites which are considered to be of importance and outstanding value to hum humanity. So they don't just tell a national story, they tell an international story, which makes a common humanity of mankind, humankind. And you can see how the UNESCO story is, is coming into this. If, if we are all part of a common humanity, if these sites tell our collective story, and these communities and people can share, protect them, then you're coming back to the idea of how you create and sustain peace. And of course, one of the most important things in the World Heritage Convention that's happened, and I'd say grown really importantly in the last uh, 15 to 20 years, is the active participation of local people in that preservation, um, which I think uh, has grown exponentially. So coming on to Hadrian's Wall. Now, there are many archaeologists and you all know so much more <laughs> about the heritage of Hadrian's Wall. I'm sure collective lifetimes of people on the phone who, who know more. So I will not try and uh, teach you to suck eggs and uh, embarrass myself. But um, Hadrian's Wall, the heritage. So uh, as I said, there's a nice little definition there of outstanding universal value at the top. And the way that UNESCO determines this concept of outstanding universal value is that these sites have to hit and feed at least one of 10 criteria. Hadrian's Wall being amazing obviously meets three of them, um, which is to exhibit an important interchange of human values, 
to bear unique or at least exceptional testimony to a cultural tradition and to be an outstanding example of a type of building. And of course, I've put there on the right, and I'm sure you all know this, and it's up on the uh, UNESCO uh, website. When I was rereading the OUV of the World Heritage Sites, one of the most uh, interesting things that came up to me really was that actually, uh, it was under criteria two, uh, an important interchange of human values. And it says that the frontiers were not this impregnable barrier, but actually it allowed the movement of people, not only military units, but also civilians and merchants. So the wall, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the wall was not this static, the Roman world and barbarians across. People were exchanging knowledge. They were working together. You had people from all over the Roman empire who were stationed along this wall. And it served as sort of a place for those interchanges of values. And I think for me, that's a really important idea that's continuing 1900 years later and is exactly what UNESCO status is also about. It's about people that yes, as I've said, the heritage of these places is the key. It does belong. It's an outstanding system and place of importance to the whole of humanity. And obviously Hadrian's Wall, but also the other lines as well across Germany, um, across the Antonine Wall, etc. But it's people and this is, UNESCO is all about bringing people together to celebrate their heritage and it becomes a tool and a means to do so. We've done a lot of research in the UK that's found that UNESCO sites are contributing at least £151 million each year to the UK economy. They are maintaining these threats and these places for future generations, but also their value is in bringing these people together and going through the website and seeing what you've got planned for the year is absolutely extraordinary and uh you know a big congratulations once again and i think it's uh it's a, a national but a world example of what world heritage site status is all about so coming over really to the next 50. so what we've got coming up this year is the 50th anniversary of the world heritage convention now this was signed as i said in 1972 uh, there's a big conference happening in Florence, but there's also going to be a big campaign which we're hoping to, to launch in the next sort of couple of weeks. And it looks at the previous 50 years of the convention, but it also looks towards the next 50. So how are UNESCO sites maintaining their threats, maintaining their places for future generations? What are the big challenges that the world faces and how can world heritage sites play their role and their part in them? World Heritage Sites cover around 10 million kilometers squared globally. That's about the size of China. They bring thousands of communities and people together to protect these sites and their places. And together as a network, they are contributing to world peace. And I think there is so much in this campaign and this year that will cap the 1900 festival and all of you can do to actually show how you're meeting and attaining these goals. So I think that's it from me, really. And uh, any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. That was just the phrase um, early on in your presentation. Um, Hadrian's Wall, us, we are contributing to outstanding value to humanity. We are outstanding value to humanity. I mean, that's the that is the amazing thing about our work and our relationship with this World Heritage Site is that to us, it's just like what we do. It's what we feel really strongly about. We're really happy doing it. We've made great friends, but actually it's really, really, really important. We're talking about our contribution to the whole of humanity. And Matt's presentation just absolutely brought, brought that to, um, to our attention. Uh, can I just note that um, the bookending of this conference is Matt at the beginning and then Chris Blanford at the end, who is the uh, president of World 
Heritage UK. And it was really deliberate when the programme was set for this conference to really sort of bookend us with that, um, that the range and the and the authority that we have on this on this project. So we we have a couple of minutes just just to mention um, Carrie Carrie's just reported to me that the previous the the, the caller that um, weird um, incident we had a moment ago. Um, he has been reported. He just signed up before the conference. He's not one of us. He's not a WALCAT person. I do apologise for the bad language. And when when we when we produce the video, Kerry will definitely be doing doing an edit there. But it's reminded me, um, given the fact that we were talking about rugby, it's like a streaker, isn't it? Something really uh, unexpected happens at the beginning of our match. Uh, but we do apologise for that. But clearly, um, we've just been hacked for the first time so we've uh, we've entered that world right a couple of moments before we go off for our comfort break um if if uh, people want to talk to matt and um and just ask him about his work or his his relationship uh, with the wall so if anybody wants to ask a question feel confident to just unmute and uh, wave wave your hand um and ask matt anything before we go off for our break. Mark Richards, I noted you joined after we had the previous incident, so you don't know what we're talking about. So just uh, just, just know that you missed, if you'd have been on time, Mark, you'd have seen something a little bit um, uh, out outrageous, but uh, any any thoughts for, for Matt? There was an interesting thing in the chat, Matt, while you were talking, you wouldn't have seen it. Our colleague, David Bruff putting in, uh, how about this is a definition? Peace is the process by which human conflicts and disputes are managed so they do not descend in, into violence. Um, I think, um, I think especially today, as we're hearing what's going on in Ukraine, um, I don't know, it feels very poignant that we're having this presentation. From Indeed, today. UNESCO's, um, so there is, there is, we've been doing quite a bit of work over the last couple of days on this. There is obviously seven World Heritage Sites in Ukraine um, and a number of creative cities. So some of our places such as Nottingham, et cetera, work very closely with Odessa and other places. Uh, we've actually worked with um, 29 countries and published a statement this morning um, across our social media, uh, standing with the people of Ukraine uh, on this. And actually, you know, UNESCO does so much around education, journalism, protection, etc. And I think, um, you know, whatever we can do to sort of support them and these sites and these people, you know, our colleagues across there, we will do. It's, yeah. uh, it's a very sad, very sad uh, time. David. Yeah, just on that, um, just to let make colleagues aware, um, Peter Stone, um, who's the UNESCO Chair of World Heritage uh, sorry, Cultural Property Protection and Peace um, at Newcastle University has unsurprisingly spent since 7 a.m. on whichever morning it was, Thursday morning, um, very deeply involved in what's going on in UK, in Ukraine um, in terms of the issues around cultural property protection um, and directly involved with officials in Ukraine and with um, officials from the UK government. So, uh, in a sense, Hadrian's Wall is being represented through Peter as we speak. Thank you, David. And uh, to, to draw your attention, everybody, that uh, David's talk actually before Chris talks on the final day, which is Thursday the 3rd, is uh, entitled World Heritage Sites and the Peace Project. Uh, so um, we'll be looking forward to hearing from you, um, David, in, in that talk. Um, good. Any other any other thoughts just before before we go off? I don't know. I feel very humbled by um, that perspective that. That we we are we're such we're part of this um worldwide initiative for people like us to join with other people like us to show respect and care and love for our uh, assets our community uh, i think what this project indicates 
mostly to me is that yes we're celebrating something which was constructed 1900 years ago but actually it's us that are here now and it's the communities along the wall it's the communities around the world who have this really strong link with with Hadrian's Wall you know when you mention it wherever you go you mention it people are so interested I've just come back from holiday I've just been in Antigua I've just been in a world heritage site Matt I've been in Nelson's Dockyard um, which celebrates five years of being a, a member of the UNESCO um, world heritage sites family and I spoke to people a lot in the hotel you you they're coming from all over the world you mentioned Hadrian's Wall everybody is interested everybody wants to know what we're up to and in fact a couple of people are going to walk the wall now as a result of uh, of of, of uh, talking to me um, it is the most extraordinary um, pull uh, and we are all connected through world heritage and it's been an absolute pleasure to have we have you with us um, to talk. Now, Matt, you're very, very welcome to stay for the rest of our day. In fact, you're very welcome to join the entire conference because you'll you'll certainly learn something and you'll certainly make new friends and you'll certainly um, uh, find out just how uh, diverse and interesting our topics are. Bill, I think we have most of our contingent back from the kettle. So may I uh, invite you to talk about our 1900 festival. I think most people do know Bill, but if you can just start with a short introduction to yourself, Bill. Surely, I'll just share screen first, just to get us all going and my long machine. Hopefully you can all see that. So great, off we go. So yeah, for those who don't know me, my name is Bill Griffiths by day. Head of Programs and Collections at Tarnawir Archives and Museums. By night, Chair of the 1900 Festival Committee. Um, so part of the Hadrian's Wall um, Management Board uh, team and things like that. So, um, and have been involved with Hadrian's Wall for over three decades now. Um, so used to be a field archaeologist working at places like Wall's End and South Shields and Chester's and, and other bits of the wall. Um, but these days I moved indoors, the back and the knees were creaking too much. So I've moved indoors to a museum job, used to run Stegadunum, and now just work in museums generally. So that's that's the potty biography of me. Um, but what I'm really here to talk about today is not me, it is 1900 years of Hadrian's Wall and how the festival is going. Give you a little update, those who've heard you before, but I'm going to assume no previous knowledge. I'll take you through the whole shebang um, in, in outline in 20 minutes. Um, and then end with a call for you to, if you're not already taking part, to come and take part. So let's see how we're doing here. Um, so a reminder, it is uh, Hadrian's Wall that we're talking about in its entirety. So not merely the wall, but the whole World Heritage Site. So right down to Maryport and on down to Ravenglass as well on the West Coast and including Arbea, South Shields, Roman Fort on the East Coast. This slide is from a previous project some of you might recall called Hadrian's Cavalry. I put it up to remind us just how many Roman museums there are along the line of Hadrian's Wall. There are plenty of other museums as well, not least, of course, the Sill, um, or visitor centre, to say not least the Sill um, in the central sector. So plenty of other, other, other places to visit as well. But a reminder that the core visitor offer in terms of museums is, is this grouping. And when we started talking at the board about doing something for Hadrian's Wall's 1900th anniversary, we were very clear we didn't want to repeat Hadrian's Cavalry. We wanted instead to open up the whole wall and everyone who's engaged with it in whatever way, shape or form to come and explore what 1900 years of the World Heritage Site means to them. So it isn't a festival of the Romans. It isn't a festival of what's on in the museums. There will be Romans. There will be things on in the museums. But the festival is much, much more broadly written than that. It is absolutely. Um, about people exploring what 1,900 years of World Heritage Site means to them. So that's what we're trying to do. We set out some criteria for inclusion. So uh, it has to take place during the year, obviously, from Hadrian's birth on the 24th of January to the end of Saturnalia on the 23rd of December. Normally, we'd expect uh, events and activities to take place within 10 miles of key World Heritage Site locations, um, but we will flex that for something relevant. And there's one or two parts in the programme I can. I'll talk you through later. Must have appropriate reference to the anniversary of 1900 years of history of Hayden's Wall. So if you want to do a, a festival of pickled eggs, you're going to have to explain how that fits with Hadrian's Wall. Um, there isn't a festival of pickled eggs yet. Um, must be suitable for family audiences, unless you specifically say otherwise, obviously. Um, obviously, we're interested in promoting diversity and inclusion 
um, across the wall, but also we want to really engage new audiences of visitors with the wall. You need to consider accessibility, how people get to event and consider sustainable event delivery. Those are the kind of criteria we want people to be thinking about if they're going to take part. Um, but it's a very, really a very, very open um, program. What I want to do is give you just a sense of, of uh, the scale of it. And I'll start with the money. I often have to start with the money. So very grateful to the North of Dying Combined Authority, who you'll see from this slide, have uh, granted us just under half a million pounds which is money held by Northumberland County Council on behalf of uh, 1900. Herbert Robbins Charitable Trust, who've so far granted £30,000, that's held by my organisation, Tanweer Archives and Museums. And Arts Council England, who've given a £15,000 grant, which is held by Allerdale Borough Council. What is interesting about these grants is all three of them work across the whole wall. You might have seen the Allerdale Borough Council grant is just work in Allerdale. In fact, it's for research and development to engage communities that don't normally consider the wall to be part of their lives, even though they live on or near it. And we're working with communities in Maryport, Hot Whistle, and the West End of Newcastle to explore what the wall could mean to them. Um, so although Allerdale, if you like, raised the money and give it out, it's spent along the whole wall. Ditto the TWAM money, which has been used for coordination and post, um, and the North of Time money, which will pay for two specific um, parts of the festival, which is an intervention in the landscape, um, which will take place in the summer, and the Festival of Saturnalia, which I'll return to later, as well as supporting coordination and marketing, revamping the website and all those sorts of things. Now, I did want to make a specific point about how tricky it's been the past couple of years. Um, if you've seen me before, uh, you might remember it was probably two years ago at the last one of these events in person, um, when we all agreed we want to do some of the community and everyone said they wanted to be part of it. We've tried to make that happen. Well, of course, a few short weeks later, I don't need to tell you what actually happened. Um, and quite rightly, all the bodies that give out funding, who you normally go to quite properly and quite correctly, focused on how do we keep the cultural sector alive, keep institutions going, keep people on their feet. So it had taken us a much longer than we had anticipated two years ago to raise the funding. As you can see, we're doing it. But even now, we haven't got all our money. Um, we're obviously very far on with a bid to National Lottery Heritage Fund, Lebanon English Heritage. There'll be bids to Historic England and Arts Council England for more money too. So even though we've started the festival, we don't have all the money we would like yet. Um, although, you know, it, all, it is all looking as much as one can ever say and keep your fingers crossed, very positive. And this is due to COVID and, and, and all those kind of delays that have held us up. And of course, we couldn't really knock the 1900th anniversary back a year or two. I think that would have been cheating. Given that most archaeologists debate, is it 2021, uh, 121 or 122 for the, for, for the original building of the wall? No one's debating 123 or 124. So I think we have to do it now. We were all ready. So th this is, a, we're in an interesting state where we, obviously you can see now, we've got a considerable amount of money, but not as much as, as we'd like. We have a small team of excellent freelancers who are working um, on the program. Um, but together they they add up to just over one person a week. And it's just worth bearing that in mind. I think people think these festivals have great big teams of people working on them. We have five or six people working on it who, who are recruited to do that. But it's like having one and a bit people in terms of time. Now, the team have moved mountains, as anyone who's connected with the festival will know, to make everything happen thus far. But I just, just wanted to understand that the, 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 the challenge we've had over the past couple of years, which you will be well aware of, just to get everything to a place where we can where we can really launch. So if things have seemed a bit late, it's been that kind of couple of years, hasn't it, folks? And I know one of the people think there's more one could have done earlier. I'm not being defensive. I'm just being very clear. There's always more we could do and always very happy to listen to, to more ideas. So that's where we are with the money. Um, one of the first things we created, of course, is a branding toolkit. So anyone doing events, can demonstrate they're part of the festival. And what we want to do, what I personally want to see, is that logo flipping well everywhere. Um, on the wall across everyone's events and, and get people excited. So anyone who's doing an event gets this branding toolkit so they can help promote their event, um, uh, you know, through their social media, uh, as well as on our website and things like that. And it's very important to raise that profile. And we started this, we launched this in the middle of December last year, as a, a press launch, just to get people aware that the, the festival was coming. Um, and we had to give a couple of examples of things that we wanted to do. And one of them you may have seen was the bunting challenge from Vindolanda. Um, and um, we just told people we were going to do this in due course. And eventually there'll be stuff on the Vindolanda website about it. And in fact, they ended up having to push it up several weeks early. Such was the demand from literally across the globe for people to take part. So 
uh, the original challenge is to make 1,900 little bunting flags, which can be displayed at Vindlander. Examples have come in already from across the globe. Um, there's a whole guild of, I think, crocheters or knitters in America who are going to make some of these. Um, people have really latched on. It seems to have been a really good sort of like last lockdown kind of thing to get involved in. And it means people can sit at home and contribute to this festival. And actually reflecting, David, on what you were saying just before we started again about how people around the world know Hadrian's Wall, um, I think it is people who have that connection who are going, I just want to do something. Maybe I can't get that. I just want to do something. And so this has given people a way to take part in the festival, which is hugely exciting. And I look forward to seeing the film bunting. Then fast forward to Hadrian's birthday and the actual launch. Um, there is some of the bunting made already, 1900 there, as you can see, and a cake. And I promise you it's a cake. You may be thinking, that doesn't look like a cake. That looks like one of those scale models that Wargamers have. Well, it does look like one. Um, it is literally the cake that looked too good to eat. However, we ate it. Um, we had a, a fantastic launch on the 24th um, across the wall. Uh, I'll, I'll come to some other parts in a second. Um, but we had you know, the speeches and the funders, as you might expect at Great North Museum, got some great TV coverage uh, for it. And the cake was central to that. It, it's interesting how much uh, cake captures people's imagination. Again, people with a long memory might recall that I said two years ago, we must have cake somewhere in this festival because I want to eat cake. Um, and lo and behold, my, my dreams come true. A cake that looks like Hadrian's Wall. What, 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 I mean, life is complete. What can I say? Um, you may be saying, is it really a cake? Well, there's the proof. It really was a cake. And it was, for those that weren't, no, I'm sorry, delicious. What a fantastic cake. So we ate a lot of cake. Um, at the other end of the wall, though, at Ravenglass, the Emperor Hadrian took a bath. It had been a long journey from Rome and he landed, so he needed a good scrub down. Um, and I think, you know, to me, this instantly, this slide just gives you that sense of the fun we want the festival to have. We'll have cake, we'll have um, comedy, we'll have these moments, but all of, all of which nevertheless have a meaning and a resonance. Because the Emperor Hadrian is having a bath in the Roman bath at Ravenglass. The often overlooked uh, bathhouse at Ravenglass, very tucked to on the fire and the Lord Heritage site, do go and see it. Um, it is gorgeous, it is a gem, and it is really a very well-preserved Roman building but often, often ignored, and it, it, uh, undeservedly so. It is, it is very much worth a good look. So do, do head down that, that coast. So that's a bit of fun with the launch. Um, and the publicity, wow. Um, I mean, Jane may, may have said this already or may say afterwards, but um, we've had plaudits from people who know their business about how much publicity we've managed to attract for the festival already. So where have we been? I mean, the Telegraph has named us as one of the top things to do in Britain this year. Uh, National Ge Geographic World Traveller is named as one of the top 30 things to do in the wall, uh, in the wall, in the world. The wall is the world, it's fine. Um, so top 30 things to do in the world. We've uh, The Guardian, Simile and others. It has been incredible. People have really latched onto this anniversary around the world. And there's good reasons for it. Um, I mean, one is everyone wants a good news story and why not? Um, but another, I think people get it. 1,900 years, um, they get the fact that's a big deal. Um, and it's a World Heritage Site that, you know, as we were saying just now, people know, they're aware of it. They may not know as much about it as we would like to, but they're interested. So we really have, um, I think, punished well above the budgetary weight we're able to bring to the marketing at this point, um, because we've got an excellent team um, dealing with it. So long may that continue. It's always a struggle with these year-long festivals to keep the, the, the press coverage up. Um, but, you know, it's still coming in so far. Um, you know, we've, we were on Euro News in Spain the other week. Um, and, and elsewhere. So the, the stories keep going. It is great fun. Now, um, we've set up a website and what we're starting to do is list all the events. Uh, so, oh, that's right. Yes, I'm just checking my slide work properly, but it has. So we listed all the events um, that are taking place um, right the way uh, along the wall. There's about 70 or 80 listed so far, but we've had 270 event proposals put forward, but we only put them on the website when they're confirmed as pretty much definitely going to happen, barring, you know, accidents and COVID and things like that. So we wait until people are sure they've got the money in place and, and know what's going to happen. So um, what I'm going to do now for a few minutes is just to take you through, just a couple of minutes, just take you through the full programme so you have a real sense of um, what it's all about. So we're, here we have, straight on that slide, here's our conference. There's a lecture by David Brees, and there's a comedy play being put on by a team, including one Nick Henderson, uh, known to many of you, I'm sure, taking place along the wall. Um, we do have events right along the wall, so 
exhibitions at Roman Moncaster, Arbea Roman Fort, um, Carvoran, all the museums and more are doing those exhibitions along the wall, as you'd expect. Um, I'm loving all the walking stuff that's going on, so it was a walking festival, and I picked out a couple more here where people are using 1900 to, to draw attention to their charities' attempts to, to raise money. So I'm really glad people are using 1900 to make money for, for, for their own charities as well. I mean, it's a great thing to hang your hat on, is 1900. So I'm really pleased to see that happening. Um, we've got things like um, tours along the various sites. We've got school programmes at the Sill, music festivals, as you can see here. So again, a really, really exciting programme of different bits and pieces. Um, in some places, we are have persuaded annual festivals uh, to join in with 900. So obviously, Maryport, the Roman festival, that happens every year. That's as you'd expect. Um, the Midsummer's Evening in Corbridge Festival is going to join 1900. The Hexham Book Festival is uh, taking part. Um, my own favourite, I haven't got a slide of it yet, but we're hoping that the Walls End uh, Town Festival, which takes place every year, will be branded 1900 because it is literally, of course, 1,900 years since the birth of Walls End. So we can claim a, a double anniversary there. So um, hopefully lots uh, will take place there. Um, but classic thing, meetings are being set up to discuss that at the moment because people didn't know what was going to be possible because of COVID. So although the programme, you know, is quite big already, it's going to grow massively in the next two months as more and more people get on board, realise they can do something, feel confident about doing something. So that's hugely exciting. Um, other things that are going on. Um, so we've got lots of local history talks and things like that. Um, one of the local businesses, um, uh, Solicitors, have got this little puppet that's going to travel along the wall and do social media for us. I think that's great. Why, why should local businesses not use the wall to promote themselves? I mean, I know in South Shields, there's the, the Arbea hairdressers. Um, so it's great to have people get involved and, and, and see the wall as that landmark in, uh, for their business as well. And you may think Binchester isn't part of Hadrian's Wall, but it's part of the Roman frontier. So we have this online activity um, uh, about the Roman fort at Binchester. Very much the Romans would have seen it as part of the system. So why shouldn't we? And again, a reminder that things don't have to be physically located. Uh, this is one of several digital uh, programs that we've got going on. Um, we have our manga, Japanese graphic novel, being drawn over the course of the year. Um, one of my personal favourites, Hadrian's Wall um, amateur radio station, which has been broadcasting for various days and really made contact with colleagues in Italy, telling them all about uh, the famous wall. Um, so that's great fun there. A technology I'm sure if the Romans could have had, they would have. Um, and would have found very useful. So it was all like galloping up and down country all the time. Um, and the, the Hadrian's Wall Learning Forum are gathering together to do a special online forum to, to tell schools all about the Hadrian's Wall offer um, in March, and that will be fantastic too. Um, it's not a festival of Romans, there will be Romans. Uh, you know, Vindolanda, we have the Irma Street Guard on its 50th anniversary. So it's great the way these anniversaries come together. The, the world famous, as it says, but rightly so, uh, Irma Street Guard, uh, Vindolanda. Um, I have to pay tribute to English Heritage uh, colleagues who have put on an amazing set of programmes for the year. They've really, really embraced the Hadrian's War Festival um, and um, uh, they're linking things to their Roman sites across the rest of the country. But obviously, big events up here on the wall as well. So hugely exciting uh, program there. Um, and just another nod for, for English Heritage is I would have a look at the, some of the quirky projects that are going on. Um, so at Corbridge, um, Francis McIntosh, known to any of you, I'm sure, is doing some uh, research and exhibition around the original excavators of Corbridge in the 19th century. Not the named directors, but the diggers. The people who never see the limelight would be really interesting to explore that because their ancestors probably live in, in and around Corbridge today. It's a great thing to explore. The Usburn Trust, um, who are doing um, some great work on um, Haven's Wall in Biker, um, really, really um, exploring where the wall uh, may have been on Urban Time side. And it's great that we've seen some publicity for that, you know, much more invisible part of the wall. Lectures on topics not just about the Romans, but that are relevant to the wall. So many, many, many things going on. I've nearly finished a couple of quirky projects, a dance project exploring um, the dance is of, of mixed race heritage, English and Italian, so he's exploring that dual nationality through dance. Other projects exploring contemporary migration because of course as we know 1,900 years ago Hadrian's Wall was an incredibly diverse place with people from Syria, Romania and Africa along it, so it's great to explore that relevance to people today. And we're finishing with the Festival of Saturnalia um, at the end of the year, um, which I hope you will all join in with. We're, you know, sorting out the programme for that now. 
there should be um, some great stuff for, for communities and individuals to join in with in December. So plan your Christmas parties around Saturnalia this year. Do support us by sharing on uh, social media. Very, very important to keep getting the word out there. Keep reminding people the festival's on. It's a great chance to remind people that Haitian's Wall is there. Um, quick, quick technical slide as to why we're doing this. Look, first up, we want more people engaged with the World Heritage Site. You are the Wall Cap Project. You are the, the, the core of this. Um, you know, it's all about more people engaging with the World Heritage Site and seeing that it's relevance to them. Obviously, the more people are engaged in it, they become brand ambassadors for Hadrian's Wall, as you all are on Wall Cap. Look, we want tourism. Again, there's no two ways about it. It's important to the economy. There's the staycation market as well, if people don't want to travel. Also, I'm sure Jane will, will have wanted to say, will say more about this. The Hadrian's Wall is a partnership. There's no one organisation that runs it. This strengthens our ability to work together as partners. And it's, that's going to be really important if we're going to get our 10-year investment strategy off the ground properly. But also, we'll get a better sense of the broader stories of the frontiers. Look, I'm a Roman military archaeologist. That's why I live and breathe. But there are other interesting stories as well. So exploring that is great. And skills and networks developed. Again, building on the strength of the World Cap project. Um, so if you haven't already thought of an idea, think of one. That's an order, not a request. Um, get on the website, get involved, register and put your ideas forward. We just want to see so much activity across the world. If there's more cake, well, I'm prepared to suffer. Um, let's see where we go. And that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. That was uh, that was uh, that was really fantastic spin through um, what's been planned. So, yes, Bill reminds us that two years ago we are sitting in Carlisle at the race course when we have never heard of the concept of COVID and we looked out and everybody said, um, yeah, I'm uh, absolutely uh, up for the partnership organising a festival, but actually Hadrian's Wall is ours. So uh, thank you very much. It's our festival. And Bill went away and the those of us um, who plan these sorts of things went away and said, OK, so that's what we do. We create this festival, but it is everybody's festival. And I I I honestly it is it's unbelievable if you haven't looked at the website do because you will be compelled to go oh actually so I've just written in my diary there's a service at Carlisle Cathedral um, in July and to celebrate all the churches along the wall I know that I really want to be in Carlisle Cathedral that night and you will find something that you think oh um, I really want to be involved in that also speaking as somebody who's just come back from abroad I don't expect sympathy, but the passenger locator forms are a nightmare. You do not need one to travel up and down Hadrian's Wall. And so make it this year to say we've got the entire Roman frontier. There will be bits of your heritage asset that you have not visited yet. Instead of trying to go to Torremolinos, think about making uh, the 1900 anniversary um, your year to explore little bits that you haven't seen so have a look at the website for businesses um as, as bill says anybody can be involved but you have to formally sign up so if you would like your business to be able to use the branding and the logo um all you have to do is make sure that you are are officially a, a member of the team and then you know you can make that part of your business um this this year uh, as well so um, uh, Bill talked a little bit about the publicity that we've received. I think it would be fair to say that we had absolutely no idea, Bill, did we, that it was just going to go so wild, so big, so soon. Yeah, we, we, we really didn't. I mean, you, you hoped, but I mean, the challenge, when we did Hadrian's Cavalry got published, but we were selling a very specific product. This time we're saying there's going to be a festival, there'll be cake, there'll be stuff. And the journalists normally will go, well, yeah, but where's the photos? Where's the, where's the people posing that we can use? We didn't really have all that. Um, but it's great that they've really embraced the fact that the, we don't know what the festival is yet. Um, it would be, uh, you know, so it would be interesting to see, um, you know, how they react when we, when we start having some, some, some more products to sell them. I should say also, by the way, I meant to say in my talk, we are aware there are some problems with registering events. Bear with us. We're trying to change forms of that at the moment because obviously we're trying to do this um, at, at quite a rate of knots now but uh, so if you're having any problems completely understand that we are on it and we're looking at it so see what, see where we go with that 
thanks, thanks, Bill, for, for letting us know that. So um, uh, I used to work in London and I know lots of people who uh, are in the uh, media and creative industries and people would say to me, oh, your coverage is fantastic, Joan, which London agency did you use? Uh, it's like, no, we've got a group of a few freelancers who live locally who've come together um, to join this project. And actually this project, it's selling itself. So this is about local work for local people as well. Uh, it's been a, it's been an absolute joy um, to get involved. And despite what Bill says, it's not all about cake, although it is quite a lot about cake. And look, I've just seen in the chat, um, uh, Matt is congratulating us uh, uh, on our on our coverage. Yes, he's he's seen that too. So that's great. I'm just going to go down into the chat just to see if there's anything else. Oh, Kerry reminds us that we're going to find more uh, more updates about the festival actually in more detail on Thursday the third of March on our final day, um, first thing in the morning. If you if you want to join us uh, for that as well. Um, but now we have half an hour left, and this is the time when those of us who love Hadrian's Wall and enjoy the relationship that we have together and that community which we have that that starts with um, a 1900 year old monument, but actually is about us living alongside it, loving it, working on it, having it in our hearts having it in our jobs and so this is the opportunity where we can just unmute if you if you want to share something or talk about an experience I mean I would love to hear from um, one of the uh, wall cap uh, volunteers about maybe one of the excavations you did last year or uh, about what you're planning on doing on on 1900 anybody who just wants to share what they're up to this is a really really open session um, and so don't worry about standing on ceremony as you can tell from us we are not um, scripted <laughs> this has not been a scripted session so far but please now um, put your hands up wave and say that you would just like to um, to say something Mark I've just seen you unmute would you like to come in oh. Yeah, that was very sharp of you, uh, uh, if, um, Jane. Uh, no, I, I was just reflecting on the, the one of the fun things I've recently done. Marta got me, um, uh, and David Breeze got me to do a, a line drawing. Now, that's nothing unusual about that, but it's the wraparound cover for this special book that's been put together by various scholars and uh, historians on Hadrian's Wall doing special papers reflecting on this 1900th year and putting a perspective on the past and the future and I had to encapsulate in the drawing uh, the history of Hadrian's Wall. So it goes back to the, what it will have originally looked like uh, through the times of um, c collapse and then the sudden discovery by uh, Clayton uh, uh, and rebuilding it in his own way uh, and through to the present day. Uh, so I, I've tried to put that together. So it's all come together as one big drawing, which is going on this book. It, it's, uh, it was a, a, an education in itself. And there's one well-known archaeologist on the cover, which I will not name. <laughs> but I, everybody's got to guess who it is when they see it. <laughs> and, uh, and although I'm not actually doing anything else, uh, strictly I did a paper in that book, but um, uh, I am still doing a film during the course of this year. We start in April and uh, my publisher contacted me yesterday. He wants a complete new edition of my Cicerone Hadrian's Wall Path Trail Guide. So that'll be a product of this year, carrying it forward, uh, as we've all got to do, carry the dream and the heritage and the importance, the international importance of Hadrian's Wall to the next generation. And I feel honoured to be a part of all that process, as, as, as I can appreciate you do. And Bill, who is a great advocate, isn't he? He's an amazing guy. I love the fact that Bill does uh, a day job um, uh, uh, during the day, but at night he uh, <laughs> spends all his time working on uh, 1900. It is a bit, it is a bit like that at the moment. But that's so lovely to hear from you, Mark, and lovely to know that the, uh, the 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 book's coming on well. You've reminded me I have to write the preface to that. But I tell, <laughs> I said to Marta, I said to Marta, I'm not putting pen to paper until after the War Cap conference because I know that the World Cup conference will give me the inspiration for my 500 words as, as we as we share our our wall community. So um, so anybody else wants to tell us what they've been up to or to talk a little bit about what happened last year? 
anybody feeling chatty? <laughs> Kerry, Kerry, tell us a little bit about what the year for, was from your perspective in terms of the organisation of the uh, of the events, you know, with COVID, without COVID. Yeah, it's um, it's as Rob said, we've had an incredibly busy year. And when he quoted the one, um, we've had an event every four days, even I couldn't believe that because we just feel like we've been sort of beavering away behind the scenes working from home and trying to do as much online and do as much uh, to keep the volunteers engaged that's been the main thing that we've wanted people to stay involved with the project and feel like they get something worthwhile out of it rather than just um sort of you know just trying to keep people in involved for the sake of it because we want this legacy which is after wall cap what what the wall looks like and the fact that we want um we want the, the the volunteers and the community groups that we've been working with to sort of be in a better and the wall to be in a better place after for example wall cap which is the point of, of these these big sort of um projects so it's kind of this next six months is going to be critical in moving forward and i think we couldn't have made this move 10 years ago on the wall for example i think we've built up this momentum um over time with lots of different wall-wide projects with the wall at the focus at uh, the world heritage site at the focus um and i think we've we've built up this momentum that means things like 1900 can kind of fly whereas i wonder if you know 10 years 15 years ago if that would have been a place for that because we as partner organizations and, and people who work along the wall and who are passionate we work well together but we work even better together now so um i Think we're in a really exciting time for the wall where we can really um involve in a very worthwhile way the volunteers and community groups that we've been working with over such a long time mm -hmm. david your hand yeah um, two or three things quickly i mean firstly um i think everyone's probably struck by um how uh lee robertson doesn't look a day older than he did at this time last year Remarkable. Um, the um, second point is that um, I think, and Bill and I, you and I can have a talk about this, I think we should let colleagues in other UK World Heritage sites know what's been going on. Um, we can do that quite readily through World Heritage UK, which I'll, I'm happy to orchestrate. Um, uh, yeah, this would be further publicity for what's happening around 1900. Um, some of them may um, may want to chip in in a in a the spirit of uh, uh, fraternal cooperation. Um, but I think more importantly, I think the all that you've described, I mean what's been done, I mean it's really been like two small fishes and five bar barley loaves from where you started with. Um, I think that would be of a considerable inspiration to many of our colleagues in other World Heritage Sites in the UK. And lastly, um, it is well nigh time I got my backside into gear and started bringing our Chinese colleagues along the Great Wall into this. And let's see what they can muster to help support their what is now their sister site of Hadrian's Wall. Actually, David, that's just reminded me, you know, it's, it's like when you go back to school and you re you bring things to the nature table to talk about what you've done and what you did over the weekend. We should mention that we, um, that you, with your massive, massive organisation job, there was the Great Wall of China and Hadrian's Wall Conference. What month was it in? Was it October of last year? It was October. October. So for three days, we had this joint conference between Hadrian's Wall and the Great Wall of China, which, of course, is, as I've learned, not a great wall, but great walls. Uh, absolutely fascinating um, conference and um, uh, um, uh, was the most nervous I think I've ever been. Bill and I both chaired a day and the very, very strict instructions we received from David about how you had to get the prominence correct when you were chairing a session to make sure that the most important person in the room at the Chinese end was entered the conference first and pronunciations. So I had all over my computer, I had post-it notes with phonetic pronunciations of Chinese names um, to make sure that we were as polite as possible to our colleagues and they were very good. They absolutely can't pr pronounce David Bruff. I have to say, I don't think there was a single Chinese person who got your name right, David, but it was, a, it was quite a thing, I have to say, in terms of my career. 
that was quite a thing um uh, being a being a speaker and a presenter at that conference and then being uh, being honored with a day of 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 chairing it but is there anybody on the call i know a lot of you have turned your screens off but is there anybody who's been involved from the get go kerry do you know anybody who's here today who's been a war cap you know volunteer um for a really long time Yes, but I don't want to put anyone on the spot. You don't want to put anybody on the spot. OK, OK, well. Well, there are people on this call who've been involved for a long time on Hadrian's Wall as a volunteer. So uh, trail volunteers are on the call. We've got volunteer guides who were part of the first iteration um, back in 2009 when we put them through a, a, an externally accredited course, which was basically hoops of fire, which they all seem to enjoy. Um, we've got volunteers who've joined through WallCap. We've got volunteers who we've not met um, who have joined through WallCap throughout the um, throughout the, the pandemic. Um, um, so yeah, there is a few, and there's a few of those volunteers who wear different hats, who've, who've volunteered in different roles. So in terms of that longevity and, and that momentum that I mentioned before, there's definitely um, definitely a cohort on here. And there's also some community groups who've been around along the wall for a lot longer than all of our projects as well. Yeah. So it's great that we've kind of bringing everything together, that sort of fresh enthusiasm and this sort of historical knowledge of, of groups who've been around for, for a while already. Well, as I said, if anybody does want to just wave and unmute and, and say hello, Lee, I see that you've turned off your uh, magnificent screen and you are now there uh, behind as a human being. Hi. Hi. Yeah, it's, it's quite bizarrely. It's actually one year, day exactly that I joined World Cup to, today. So, uh, so yeah, I've, I've been on two gigs, so I might, I might look the same as I did a year ago, but my knees don't feel like it. <laughs> Which ones were you on, Lee? I was on uh, Cambeck and Corbridge, the, the not wet Corbridge one. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Nice okay. one. Uh, and I've also I also did some cleaning up as well at uh, Corbridge Roman Town on on some of the finds. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed every every minute of it. It was fascinating. Um, so thanks to everybody involved uh, to give me that opportunity. It's been great. So what made you what made you sign up? Um, I was um, I was absolutely obsessed with it when I was a kid, um, and on my work experience at high school, I actually went on a dig with Newcastle University at uh, the Keep in Newcastle City Centre. Um, I got a bit older, and guitars and girls and stuff got in the way. <laughs> no, uh, what well, guitars? It wasn't you earlier on, was it? With the <laughs> I don't have the relevant amount of hair. <laughs> Um, so, 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 no, that wasn't me. <laughs> um, and uh, it was, uh, I, I, I took early retirement, uh, just funnily enough, around about when the pandemic uh, started. Um, and I was sort of looking around at stuff to uh, occupy my time. And I did a, a couple of future learn courses on archaeology. Um, and uh, it kind of sparked me interest. So I was looking around at other things, and I found WorldCat on the uh, on the internet. And I thought, oh well, you know, it's it's one of my favourite parts of the country as well. I mean, I, I live sort of I live outside uh, the Roman Wall area itself. But when I was a kid, we used to uh, holiday in a caravan up at Gilsland. Um, so I love the area, and uh, it was just a great opportunity. I also did. I was. I also did a beacon on that illum illuminating the wall that was held quite a few years ago. So it kind of, I'd already started to get interested again. Um, so yeah, that, that 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 was what got me back into it, and uh, I've loved every minute of it since. So amazing. You you haven't got the mud stains out of the knees of your trousers then, presumably from the wet Corbridge one, but. <laughs> The, the 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 worst one was the uh, Cambeck one because everything was red, bright red. So my boots are still bright red. My waterproof trousers are still bright red on the knees. So yeah, it was. Uh, but yeah, superb. Thoroughly enjoyed it all. Well, I'm um I uh, was I benefited from having some breaks last year and some holidays because we've got a boat in Scotland, which meant that we didn't, you know, we, when nobody could go on holiday, it meant that we luckily could. But it meant that I missed the Carlisle excavation and um, I never got to see it. And uh, I'm obviously looking forward to seeing the finds. But I um, I've, I noticed that Nick, are you still here? 
Are you behind your screen, Nick? Yeah. You're there. Um, yeah, so obviously, Carlisle excavation being one of the highlights of, of, of your year. Can you just give us a bit of a reflection about, about how that went for you? It's it's um no I love it if you if you hear any sort of bluegrass or hillbilly music going on in the background that's because they're watching a film in the other room. Oh. Um, so just just thought I'd give preface that in case, uh, because that comes over the call. The um, but yeah no it was I think it went it's gone really well. I was actually at that event at the cricket club last night. Um, sort of the we had another sort of volunteer event and an update there. But the the level of interest from um, people in Carlisle I think it's been probably the highlight. For me, Percy, for the the uh, for those who don't know, I've, I've worked as the Haitian Hall Development Officer since twenty uh, late twenty nineteen, and then a couple months later, obviously COVID happened, and I've had the privilege of working with and, and as part of the Haitian Hall Partnership, and um, sort of throughout and seeing how the partnership works together very well, and um, but we've for the dig just in sheer numbers, it's been a you know we've quadrupled the the target for volunteer engagement. But also it's just been a really nice crowd. It, it's now one of the, um, the exhibition launches 5th of March at Tully House and it will then be going on a tour as well um, afterwards around a series of venues, um, community venues in Carlisle. But it's the largest, I believe it's the largest assemblage of finds from any Roman site in Carlisle. Um, there's over 450 coins um, from ranging from the 70s right through to sort of 5th century um, from sort of the Roman period and then with so there's been quite a the level of artifacts that have come out of it has been absolutely fantastic too but generally speaking from in terms of chatting with the volunteers it's had a real a really good impact on people's lives and uh, especially after covid and we've formed a really lovely community out of it very much how wallcat is sort of you know that sort of volunteer community so it's very much that kind of wall is is a community um and it's sort of built around the heritage but then having a real world impact on people's lives so it's been yeah. quite nice um if that was sort of what you're um, yeah yeah exactly it's just uh, yeah i'm going to telly house actually on friday night um so i'm look, really looking forward to seeing um seeing that uh, some of those some of those finds i've actually never held a find uh, i mean obviously i've been lucky enough to be to see some of them but i've never actually held anything roman in in my hand and so many of you on this um, on this screen today will have done. I, I can only imagine how thrilling it is. Although, of course, I have been shown around an excavation by Tony Wilmot. So that is obviously um, uh, one of the benefits of being the chair is that you get access to all areas with the great uh, archaeologists. But um, yes, Jane's just saying you should have, I should have volunteered on the site, Jane. It's just that I was trying to keep my marriage intact. And in order to um, go on holiday with, <laughs> with my husband, I had to forego the, uh, uh, the the excavation at, uh, at at Carlisle, but there's a um, uh, it's it's going to be great to see the re results of that. And um, uh, obviously, the the if you go on the website to look about what's happening this year for 1900, you will see that um, some of the academic conferences uh, have exactly the same profile as a one day uh, bring and buy sale along along the wall. You know, everything is just judged on um, the, uh, having Hadrian's Wall at the heart of it. There is no uh, precedent for some of the academic conferences, but clearly some of them will be talking about the excavations that have taken place this year and uh, starting to record those. Um, those uh, those finds. I've been. Um, oh look, so Neil's got a spare trowel, and uh, uh, at some point, I'd, at some point, I would I would absolutely love to do that. And don't forget, on um, Tuesday at nine thirty, we are honoured um, and excited to have at the World Cup conference Chloe Duckworth, who, as many of you will see, is um, one of the star archaeologists in the uh, Digging for Britain uh, programme, which is um, on, I mean, literally every five minutes there is an archaeology. Well, is, is that, Bill, is that your influence from 900? Did you speak to every television channel in UK and just say, just have lots of archaeology on the telly? No, I think they just saw a press coverage and thought they'd better do it, really. I think it's as simple as that. I think that there is, uh, there are, there are so many um, archaeology programmes. But of course, the, um, that, that, uh, um, that programme that Chloe was in, uh, the great, sorry, it wasn't the Digging for Britain, it, that's the, um, 
Oh, remind me the name of the woman who is the presenter. Oh, somebody remind me. Alice Roberts. Alice Roberts. Dr. Alice Roberts. Thank you very much. Yes, Barbara, you just mouthed it before Bill said it out loud. Thank, thank you very much. So that's the programme that she fronts. But of course, Chloe is involved in the Great British Dig, um, which uh, did the excavation at Benwell. And so leading from what Bill said about that Arts Council funding, despite it's being held by Allerdale Borough Council, it's actually some of that money will be um, going towards the people of the West End of Newcastle to um, really uh, engage the relationship they with they have with with the wall. So look at everything. Everything is completely connected, isn't it? So if if anybody hasn't. Uh, and I can't imagine that you haven't studied Kerry's programme, because really, how could you be a member of WALCAP without um, being signing up to everything that's going on in your own conference? But do have another look um, to to make sure that you're signed up for the talks that you want. I think we said in the preamble that you can up to an hour before you can uh, you can log in. But there's also if you if you go to Eventbrite, you can log up, log in to the whole day, which certainly saved me quite a lot of typing. Um, um, uh, so try try doing that as well so that's 9 30 on tuesday so we're basically having sunday and monday off and what's happened with since last conference is that every bit of feedback that you gave has been fed into the program of this conference so you know what time we start the length of the breaks how many discussions you want the nature of your talks um, that you want to have and everything so it's a program that's been very much um, influenced by you and it's a combination of of people who you are already working with like like uh, ian and in, in, in the geologist jane but it's also bringing in people from the wider world and as I said um, earlier on incredibly grateful to Matt for sparing us time on his Saturday or you know this is this is real privilege for us um, to, to have you Matt because this is your weekend um, but to have that bookend of our relationship with UNESCO and the placing of Hadrian's Wall in a world context and how our work becomes part of the, the wider world of making humanity, helping humanity to be better because of our respect for our cultural heritage and our engagement in our cultural heritage. And that is quite an extraordinary thing that we're all doing on this Saturday afternoon.